thanks very much. I uh, appreciate the invitation from Albert and the Institute. And uh, I will be talking about what is actually a fairly controversial issue in the world, uh, localization of Chinese investments in Africa. And uh, this topic, I think, is important for a couple reasons. It's important for political reasons, and it's important for economic reasons. The political reasons derive mainly from the fact that there is uh, international discourse about the Chinese presence in Africa, and more specifically about Chinese investments. And an important part of this uh, discourse has to do with the question of whether Chinese enterprises established in Africa do indeed localize, localize in the sense of localizing their workforces primarily, and then also uh, localizing in other ways, localizing their connection with suppliers, uh, localizing their connection with subcontractors, localizing their products, localizing their markets, and then of course localizing in the cultural and social sense. And uh, as Albert mentioned, myself and Yen Hai Rong, who's an anthropologist at Hong Kong Polytechnic, are working together on a book manuscript about the whole question of the localization of Chinese enterprises in Africa. Right now, it's a humongous 528 pages, but we intend to uh, whittle it down in the near future and get it published. Well, the subject that I'm going to talk about is actually a subject which um, is related to the most persistent and widespread myth about the Chinese presence in Africa. And that is the myth that Chinese enterprises do not localize, uh, particularly their workforces in Africa. In uh, August, uh, the United States government held a big meeting with African leaders. And altogether, I think over 40 African leaders came. And at this meeting, uh, there was a speech, of course, by President Obama. There were speeches uh, by Vice President Biden, by Secretary of State Kerry, etc. All of them referred to this idea that Chinese enterprises in Africa don't localize. And this was a warning, in effect, to African leaders that if you deal with the Chinese, then you will encounter this problem. Also, uh, the media, particularly in the West and especially in the United States, uh, likes to propagate this idea. So, for example, Howard French, who's probably the uh, leading journalist in the whole United States, a longtime journalist for uh, the New York Times, now a professor at Columbia School of Journalism, and author of a recent book about the Chinese presence in Africa, has uh, written that the Chinese government sends to Africa large work crews on big infrastructure projects. Essentially, all of the labor is done by Chinese people. So um, that all the uh, labor is done by Chinese people, and uh, they live typically in a compound. They have relatively little exposure to the African environment and the local economy. Another example in this regard um, is uh, a play that was composed by a professor at the University of Cape Town uh, in South Africa, the very institution with which we had a large-scale meeting on China and Africa that Albert mentioned. And this play, Fishers of Hope Toweret, uh, shows a Chinese company operating in Kenya, building a road, and uh, refusing to hire local Africans to work on building that road. Well, actually, after this play came out, just after it came out, a study was completed. Not my study. Uh, I'll talk about my study in a few minutes. But a study was completed uh, by a foundation uh, in uh, Africa, Chinese foundation, studied 75 Chinese enterprises uh, in Kenya. Actually, they sent out questionnaires to many more than that, but they got 75 responses, which is a decent response rate. And uh, this uh, survey showed that 90% of the workforces for Chinese companies in Kenya that were doing manufacturing or construction were local people. And 82% of those working for Chinese companies in the service sector were local people. Well, the discourse about uh, the Chinese presence in Africa and localization uh, typically attributes Chinese non-localization of workforces or alleged non-localization and non-adaption 
to local laws and customs to uh, Chinese venality, that is greed, uh, ignorance, or ethnocentricity. But the inaccuracy of this claim has actually been known for quite some time among scholars. That is, those of us who are specialists in China and Africa have known for a long time that this claim is largely inaccurate. So we think that the persistence of the claim is related to the perception, at least, uh, that making the claim will have some political utility in terms of the perceived contestation between uh, the West and China in Africa, particularly between the United States and China in Africa, since most of what I'm talking about here today uh, is something that originates from the United States. Now, uh, Albert mentioned, and I've mentioned already, that um, we're engaged in this book project. Uh, we make use of thousands of documents and 400, more than 400 interviews conducted in 11 African countries about uh, the activities of Chinese enterprises in those countries. And we've done this in order to build a database on workforce localization in Chinese enterprises and projects. So we've gathered descriptive statistics uh, from more than 400 enterprises, construction projects, industries, and countries thus far, and it's still ongoing. And I have uh, my UROP student, Kevin, sitting right here uh, to thank in that regard, who's been very helpful in terms of this project. Well, I'll talk first about our findings. Um, while Chinese investment in Africa has mostly uh, just started in the 21st century, nevertheless, localization has been present from the onset, and it's ongoing and developing. It's now at a fairly well-advanced stage. Almost all Chinese enterprises and projects in Africa, regardless of their size, have Africans as the majority of workers. A lot of variation exists from enterprise to enterprise, project to project, even a bit from sector to sector, and I'll talk about that later. Uh, but the mean proportion of Africans working at Chinese enterprises uh, in Africa is somewhere in the mid-80s. That is mid-80%. As for Chinese managers in uh, enterprises in Africa who we've interviewed, and we've interviewed many scores of them, uh, most of them are firmly convinced that they should localize. And of course, they think that they should localize uh, because it's in their interest to do so. It's um, much cheaper uh, to hire local people, generally, uh, than it is to bring people from China. And of course, they're well adapted to local circumstances, which provides a considerable advantage. And then other enterprises, foreign enterprises in Africa, of course, also localize. Outside of Africa, uh, and we're doing some research about this right now, uh, Chinese enterprises in most countries are also uh, quite localized in accordance with the local circumstances. There is no convincing evidence that Chinese enterprises in Africa or in other parts of the world are any less localized than foreign investors from other countries are. But actually, it's a little bit difficult to tell because surprisingly, and I was certainly surprised by this, it's easier to find information, statistics, about localization rates at Chinese enterprises than it is uh, at the enterprises of uh, companies from other foreign countries. And if we have time, I can go into why that might be so. Now, there are some differences between uh, Chinese investors and non-Chinese investors in terms of localization. Uh, they're more structural than they are ideational. That is, it's not mainly a function of the worldview, the ideology, the outlook on life on the part of people coming from either China or from some other place, but rather it's the objective circumstances that the two different sets of companies find themselves in, Chinese on the one hand, say Western firms on the other hand. If we uh, talk about Western firms in Africa, uh, they've certainly been there much longer. Uh, 
Uh, their managers and their engineers uh, speak the colonial languages, English, French, Portuguese, etc. And they share other cultural elements with Africans. Uh, Western firms are also advantaged as being seen by Africans as white. Uh, un, for better or worse, uh, this idea is highly prevalent uh, in Africa. And associated with that is the idea that the people who manage these firms, who are engineers for the firms, etc., are uh, competent, uh, that they are high paying, that they're ethical, that they're all good things. Uh, Western firms, of course, also have a greater financial incentive to localize uh, than Chinese firms do because it costs a lot more to bring a Western expat to work in Africa than it does to bring, say, a Chinese manager or engineer. A Chinese firm's activities uh, also require uh, that more non-locals be involved in those activities than is the case with uh, investments from other countries, particularly Western countries. Uh, Chinese are more involved in construction and manufacturing than other foreign investors are in Africa, especially Western investors. But they must contend with the acute shortage that exists of skilled personnel in many African countries. Uh, these, there's a shortage of managers, a shortage of engineers particularly, and of skilled workers. Not a shortage of skilled workers per se, but a shortage of skilled workers to work on the kind of projects that Chinese construction companies particularly engage in. So an example of the shortages uh, of skills that exist in sub-African countries can be found by this statistic. Now, South Africa is Africa's most developed country, and yet there is an acute shortage of engineers. Uh, South Africa has 50 million people. There are only about 35,000 engineers in South Africa. So that is one engineer to every 1,428 people. Now, if you compare that to Hong Kong, we have 7.2 million people here. And we have uh, about 25,000 registered engineers. So that's one engineer to every 288 people here. If you look at the mainland and you consider just graduate engineers, there are about uh, 2.4 million engineers with bachelor's or higher degrees in China. So that's uh, one engineer to every 542 people. But of course, uh, in the mainland, there also are lots of people who are engineers who don't have bachelor's degrees. They're Dajuan graduates, for example. So uh, there actually are over 10 million engineers in the mainland. So the, the ratio uh, actually is just as high as here in Hong Kong. So this skill shortage is in South Africa, the most uh, developed country uh, in the continent. But uh, uh, the situation is worse in many other countries. And in large part, this is not because Africa doesn't produce, say, engineers, but lots of African engineers emigrate. Uh, they go to places like Canada and Australia to earn higher salaries. Uh, Chinese also do more tightly scheduled government projects than uh, do other uh, foreign firms involved in Africa. So a lot of these projects uh, are done uh, at the instance of the government. Uh, they want to have a project completed uh, by an election time, or they want to have it completed by a big sports meet or something of the sort, and Chinese companies uh, get the contract to do it. They have to complete it on schedule. Conditions to complete it on schedule are often not optimal, and they have to bring in local workers at the last minute to finish the project on time. Uh, the other advantage that other foreign investors have, particularly Westerners, uh, is that they have been in Africa much earlier. Uh, so they have had much more continuous access to skilled labor. And many Chinese enterprises, compared to other enterprises, are relatively low profit operations. And this is quite deliberate, because profit rates in China are actually much lower than they are in the Western world, particularly for construction. 
So a lot of uh, Chinese enterprises being low profit are at a disadvantage. They can't pay the pay scales uh, that Western investors and even some local uh, companies can do. And that makes it more difficult for them to acquire scarce skilled labor. Well, the presence of uh, Chinese SOEs, state-owned enterprises in Africa, also creates a kind of difference with Western and other foreign investors. Chinese SOEs are much more likely than uh, Western investors to consider political factors in their decision making. And I'll give you an example from the country where Yen Hai Rong and I do most of our field work, which is Zambia in Southern Africa. Uh, there's about three billion U.S. dollars worth of investment in Zambia by Chinese companies, mostly in mining. The biggest company is CNMC. Uh, this company uh, owns a couple mines, a couple smelters in Zambia. During the global financial crisis of 2008 to 2009, uh, the company adopted what it called the Sanbu policy, three no's. That is, that there would be no layoffs of workers, uh, that there would be no scaling back of investment, and there would be no halt uh, to new investment plans. And this was in sharp contrast to what the Western investors did, because uh, some Western companies folded up entirely, uh, abandoned their mines, abandoned their workforces. Others scaled back very considerably because the price of copper the main mine, mining product in Zambia fell precipitously during the global financial crisis. So the Western companies left or cut back, uh, and uh, the Chinese companies, uh, particularly CNMC, engaged in counter-cyclical investment. That is, they bought abandoned mines, and they increased the sizes of their workforce, and that stood them in good stead uh, very soon thereafter when the price of copper climbed back up again. This decision was made by the company. It's a central government, state-owned company. But needless to say, it was endorsed by the Chinese government for political reasons, and it was much appreciated uh, by the Zambian government and people there. Uh, another example, more recent, uh, is that Chinese companies have been keeping many of their Chinese employees on the job um, at oil installations, mines, and other work sites in South Sudan. South Sudan, you may know, uh, experienced a very long period of war uh, with the North, uh, but more recently, a civil war in South Sudan, fighting going on in many different parts of the country. Uh, and yet, the Chinese government agreed that um, it would not abandon uh, the activities of its uh, state-owned companies in South Sudan because of the economic ramifications that that would have for South Sudan. So uh, its employees are, in effect, endangered, but uh, this serves well the interests of South Sudan. And for political reasons, then, the Chinese government made the decision uh, to keep its employees in place. And the same is true in West Africa, in Liberia, uh, Guinea, uh, and other countries that have been affected by the Ebola crisis recently. That is, uh, while the other foreign companies pulled out their, uh, at least their foreign workforces, uh, the Chinese companies have by and large kept their workforces in place. Uh, doing mining or whatever else they happen to be doing uh, in those West African countries. And again, this is a political decision uh, taken by state-owned companies and by the Chinese government. So uh, our empirical conclusion about the question of Chinese localization in Africa is that uh, Chinese firms are worse in some respects uh, than other firms. Uh, they're worse in respect of having uh, fewer local managers and fewer engineers. And I think I've explained some of the reasons why that's so, but objectively, they are worse in that regard. The percentages are somewhat lower. Uh, they are the same in many aspects as other companies. Uh, that is, uh, by and large, overall, they have a high proportion of local workers. Uh, 
uh, and they are be better in some respects. And the main respect in which they're better, I've just talked about. That is, they take into account uh, political factors, the relationship between uh, China and uh, local African states, and they make decisions uh, which uh, seem to be to the mutual advantage of China and those states. Now that's the empirical aspect. There's also a conceptual aspect. And we question the assumption of universal norms of localization. That is, there are different standards of localization that are in fact being applied uh, to Chinese firms and Western firms operating in Africa and perhaps uh, around the world. The whole notion of universal localization, we think, represents a Western constructed approach and it serves Western interests. First of all, it allows Western countries uh, to easily bring in high paid expats. And these expats are automatically assumed to be highly competent specialists, not workers. Uh, and they are entitled to live a stereotypical expat life. Uh, that is a, a very good life in the countries uh, where they are posted, a life that resembles in many ways the life that the colonialists had in Africa. But this is not at all the case with Chinese. That is, Chinese are expected to work and to live differently uh, than uh, Western investors do. Also, uh, the different standards uh, we require that because of the colonial legacy, everyone has to adapt to Western culture and to Western imposed technical standards. That is, people have to speak Western languages, they have to use the standards which have emanated particularly from the United States and Europe. They can't, for example, use Chinese standards. And Chinese standards, of course, are used in the biggest country in the world. Well, the result of this is that uh, localization norms make uh, adaption to African circumstances relatively easy for Western investors and much harder for others, not just Chinese, but uh, investors coming from other developing countries like uh, India, Brazil, etc. Most Chinese firms are still quite new to Africa, and they are also not internationalized, let alone globalized. There's a lot of talk now about how uh, Chinese companies are internationalized, but if you compare them to the long existing Western countries and their investments uh, in Africa and other parts of the developing world, uh, it's quite not the case that uh, Chinese companies have reached the stage of uh, internationalization, uh, let alone globalization. First of all, Chinese investment uh, in Africa is at a much lower level than Western investment is. 90% of the investment in Africa, the stock of investment in Africa, comes from North America or Europe. Uh, Jap uh, Chinese investment in Africa is also more marginal uh, than Western investment. Uh, that is, Chinese companies have many fewer oil blocks in Africa. Uh, the mines that are owned by Chinese companies tend to be the oldest, least productive, least profitable uh, mines. And of course, in terms of business networks, uh, the Western companies have it all over Chinese companies in terms of how long the networks have existed, how extensive they are, et cetera. So we argue that localization cannot be seen as a one-size-fits-all concept. Uh, Chinese investment is often not even national, uh, let alone um, global or uh, international. Often the investment is from one Chinese locality, say a Chinese province or uh, even a Chinese city, uh, to a particular locality in Africa. As you may know, lots of Chinese uh, state-owned enterprises are not owned by the central government. In fact, most of them are owned by provinces or municipalities. And these are not necessarily companies with an international outlook, or at least they're only now starting to develop one. Chinese firms in Africa are um, not internationalized, let alone globalized. They have little experience, for example, in employing foreigners. And they have even less experience employing people who are neither Chinese 
nor are locals. But uh, large Western companies have plenty of experience in doing that, and they source their employees from all over the world. So most Western firms have uh, long been globalized in terms of employment of managers and professionals, especially. And that's uh, who can attract, therefore, um, the African managers and engineers, for example. Also, we think that no global consensus exists on what constitutes localization. If you compare, for example, what Chinese think about localization and what Africans think about localization, the, the two ways of thinking don't completely overlap. For example, Chinese um, think in terms of workforce localization that uh, one should look at the workforce as a whole to see whether it's uh, localized or becoming localized. Whereas African elites, at least, they focus mainly in their discussions about localization about how many local managers are being hired. And they don't really have that much regard for, for example, the uh, ordinary workers. It doesn't really matter as much to them whether they are being localized or not. Uh, Africans also generally seek um, immediate conformity to local laws and local customs. Uh, in part, this is because the preceding investors, largely coming from the West, have had a long time uh, to adjust to those local laws and customs, whereas Chinese are more recent arrivals. The Chinese perspective is generally that yes, we should pay attention to local laws, to local customs, we should get to know them, we should get to implement them, but the primary thing is to get the job done. Uh, and that, again, is a function of the fact that Chinese companies are in a different objective circumstance than lots of other investors are. Uh, also, Africans tend to see trans-ethnic acculturation and inter-ethnic socializing as an immediate necessity. Now, I say that they think that it's an immediate necessity, but there's an exception to this. White people are entirely exempted from that kind of rule. That is, they get to be uh, expats and to not associate with Africans very much outside the workplace. And because this was the role that the colonialists had, uh, they are by and large exempted from uh, the requirement that they fit into African society. But Chinese, coming from another developing country, are thought about as people who should adjust uh, to local circumstances much more quickly. Chinese, however, see this uh, circumstance as being one that necessitates gradual adjustment uh, to the local way of life. And I can tell you that I've been doing uh, work about China and Africa now for more than 10 years. And even in those 10 years, I've seen that uh, Chinese, in terms of adjusting to the local cultures where they find themselves in, in Africa, learning local languages, for example, uh, they have made much more progress in recent years than they had uh, at the outset of my investigations. That is, they're generally much more adjusted uh, to local African life now than they were uh, even 10 years ago. Now we're going to uh, be carrying out additional analysis as part of our study, and our method is that we make use of every available statistic on workforce localization. We want to contrast what we do as social scientists with what journalists, for example, do, or not to speak of politicians, uh, in terms of cherry-picking statistics uh, or cherry-picking everything. Uh, we want to ensure that we make use of everything that we can possibly find, and we've been uh, conducting uh, a very laborious culling of documents and, of course, making use of our interviews to that effect. Looking at enterprises, looking at individual projects, looking at workforces in entire countries in Africa, etc. And we want to test some hypotheses about the factors that make for greater or, local, or, or lesser localization, including, first of all, uh, 
the hypothesis that uh, localization is furthered by political stability and industrial development because stability and development uh, lead to a greater abundance of skilled labor, more skilled labor, easier it is to localize, the less there is a necessity of bringing people from China. Also, uh, the hypothesis that localization proceeds further the longer that a company is in Africa. And we already uh, know this to be the case through our interviews, but also the survey that was conducted in Kenya last year that I referred to at the outset. This has also shown that the longer a Chinese enterprise was in Kenya, the more localized it became in all respects. Also, um, the hypothesis that Chinese state-owned enterprises are just as likely to localize as Chinese private enterprises. Uh, there's some contention about this, and we hope to arrive at a conclusion about it fairly soon. Uh, also, that larger enterprises can more readily localize than small and medium-sized enterprises. And that, of course, is because small and medium-sized enterprises, at least in the Chinese context, tend to have a family aspect associated with them. So, of course, you want to bring uh, your spouse, uh, your children, uh, your relatives, etc., to work in your, the enterprise that you've established in Africa. Uh, also, that there is no strong variation in terms of localization across economic sectors. And uh, we've already, I think, established that there isn't much of a variation, with the possible exception of telecommunications. Uh, telecommunications is, of course, a very high-tech industry. Uh, there are very few firms involved. If you're talking about Chinese telecommunications in Africa, you're mainly talking about two companies, Huawei and ZTE, Zhongxin. Uh, and of course, we have done interviews with both of these companies, most recently when I was in South Africa to attend the conference that Albert mentioned. I did an interview with the uh, local uh, Zhongxin uh, managers. And uh, we found that uh, in telecommunications, the rate of workforce localization is somewhat smaller. It's still a majority localized workforce, but on average, only around 60 to 65 percent of uh, employees and those Chinese companies in Africa are locals. That we think will change. Uh, it, will, it has been increasing. And if you look at other parts of the developing world, uh, the rate of localization of Chinese telecommunications companies is even higher because uh, they've been in those parts of the world longer. Also, uh, the greatest lag in localization uh, has to do with management, that it is, it's harder to find local managers than it is to find any other segment of the workforce. <clears throat> this has a lot to do with the way that uh, Africa has uh, developed economically, uh, but that also is slowly changing. That is, the rate of local management has been increasing. Uh, for example, if you look at this uh, thought leadership brief uh, that the uh, IEMS has produced with my article on the cover, uh, and you look at the back of it, you'll see a picture of me in mining gear. Uh, that was from uh, my visit with the Enhai Rong to the Chibaluma mine in Zambia. So we went down into the mine. Uh, that's why we're dressed in this outfit. Uh, but uh, what's interesting about that mine is that it's owned by a big Chinese SOE, Jinchuan, and uh, that mine employs about 750 people. Of those 750 people, there are only two Chinese. And uh, those Chinese are just there to report back to headquarters in Beijing about what's going on at the company. They're both engineers. Uh, and all the managers are local people. And this is something new in terms of Chinese enterprises in Africa, a wholly localized management. Also, uh, in terms of adaption to local customs and local laws and the socialization between Chinese and Africans, um, we have found uh, <clears throat> that this is proceeding rapidly. Uh, but again, it's a very uneven pattern. And then um, localization results. Um, we want to see whether localization results um, in improved conditions uh, 
of service uh, for Africans uh, employed by Chinese companies. And uh, there are some examples that we can point to where that is the case, but we haven't yet determined whether it's generally the case or not. So our conclusion, uh, our, our findings certainly clash with uh, the supposed Chinese exceptionalism in Africa which has been uh, widely discussed uh, by the Western media, particularly. Uh, it contradicts the aspects of uh, what Western politicians and the media um, have created in terms of a negative narrative about the Chinese presence in Africa. And uh, we also have uh, looked at the question of how localization rates uh, can be uh, enhanced. And we think there's, there is and should be a debate about this. But the debate can only take place uh, in a coherent way if we are comparing apples and apples rather than apples and oranges. And most of the comparisons that are done between Chinese companies on the one hand and other foreign investors in Africa on the other hand are basically apples and oranges comparisons. Another interesting aspect, I think, in terms of our conclusion is the degree to which uh, Chinese companies are adapting uh, to local culture and socialization with Africans. And we are particularly interested in taking up the question of whether Chinese companies, <coughs> excuse me, whether Chinese companies are self-isolating. You remember the quote uh, that I showed from Howard French, the US journalist, at the outset of the talk, how Chinese live in compounds, isolating themselves from Africans. Uh, we have found that that is generally not the case for the Chinese populations as a whole. That is, Chinese small and medium-sized enterprise owners and managers and Chinese employees are more likely to live among Africans and to learn local African languages than our Western expats. Our analysis of uh, OFDI, OFDI in Africa, um, we think, should move away from uh, speaking uh, about the question of localization of workforces, per se, to other important employment and labor issues. And some of these are, for example, how Chinese and Africans can cooperate uh, to enhance skills in Africa. Uh, the idea of, for example, of setting up together more vocational schools to train more skilled workers has been talked about a lot. And Lian Chan, who is a professor at uh, Beida, Beijing University, has been talking a lot about this lately. Uh, also, there is a possibility of setting up Chinese universities in Africa. Lots of Africans now go to study in China. Right now, there are about 32,000 Africans studying in China. But um, Zhou Yuxiao, uh, the former ambassador of China to Zambia, who we know well, uh, has proposed the idea of the Chinese government or Chinese universities setting up branches in Africa and therefore being able to reach a larger population of African students. So this is another idea that's just a possibility. Um, also, the question of how African states can improve and enforce their laws with regard to uh, localization. Uh, at present, there really are no studies about this. And uh, that's a fruitful field for endeavor. That is to look at the wide range of laws, regulations, guidelines, et cetera, that it exists in the 55 different African states and see whether they could be aligned in some way through African regional institutions, through the African Union, or some other mechanism. Also, how the power asymmetry between African societies and foreign investors can be overcome. This power asymmetry, of course, has existed now for hundreds of years uh, from the colonial period on. Uh, it has fostered the exploitation of Africans. Uh, and the question is whether it can be mitigated, uh, for example, uh, through pan-Africanism, uh, an ideology uh, greatly to be cherished, I think. Uh, also, uh, whether Chinese state-owned enterprises in Africa can uh, 
generalize the three nodes policy that I spoke about before. Uh, that policy uh, could be generalized, for example, through a pledge on the part of Chinese, uh, the Chinese government to get at least its state-owned enterprises to seriously consider counter-cyclical uh, investment uh, because there's bound to be additional crises uh, in the world economy and locally in Africa, of course. And then uh, whether the localization policies of Chinese enterprises can be systematized in some way. That is, uh, can the Chinese government, can Chinese enterprises uh, proclaim their own guidelines uh, for localization? Can they establish quotas for localization? Uh, these are questions to be discussed. And then whether uh, Chinese can be better prepared in terms of uh, training in languages, uh, familiarity with African uh, culture, and of course, uh, integration in terms of uh, Chinese and Africans working alongside each other and living alongside each other in Africa. So um, that's my talk for the day. I would be glad to answer any questions you have about it, but I can also address questions about the uh, larger topic of the Chinese presence in Africa. Thanks very much. So I'm going to right up to the floor for questions. Um, uh, JC first, and then David. And well, thank you very much for your talk. I found it fascinating. I think there is certainly an element of truth on what you emphasize as the Western portrayal of Chinese corporate activities in China. Now, I'm actually in the management department, and from my perspective, I wonder if you're, there's a better way to make the argument that, of Chinese exceptionalism not being that exceptional. Because instead of looking at Western companies as your point of comparison, I mean, there's at least many different types of multinational corporations. You have multinational corporations that are more globalized or transnationalized, like such as many of the ones from the US. But then you have another group of multinationals from countries such as Germany, Korea, and Japan, which are much more ethnocentric. So I think that'd be one broader group for comparison. And maybe it's Asian exceptionalism, not Chinese exceptionalism. So maybe what you want to do is compare Korea, Japan, and against of Chinese companies. And finally, another fascinating comparison would be that of Indian multinationals such as Tata or Reliance, because they've long had a presence in Africa. And I think, um, I was wondering if you've actually seen any evidence of at any of these levels of analysis. It's a very interesting, interesting point. point. Uh, and, and I think, I think it, it is true that there is now analysis going on, including by ourselves. ourselves about um, how Chinese companies compare particularly to uh, investors from other developing countries. And this, in the African context, would mainly uh, be India, uh, but also Brazil, which is very extensively engaged in uh, investments in the Lusophone countries in Africa, Angola, Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau. Uh, so, those, Those kind of comparisons, comparisons are now ongoing. ongoing. They've been very, very recently started by several different uh, China-Africa China, specialists. And, and in, in terms, terms of workforce, workforce localization, we're, we're doing that now. now. Uh, for, for example, I recently looked at uh, the degrees of localization uh, with regard to Indian companies uh, that are investing in Africa. Uh, uh, but uh, it's, it's, a, a, it's a fairly extensive project, project that would have to be undertaken. I don't know whether it'll, it'll be undertaken by me, but I can almost guarantee uh, that what you've recommended uh, will, will be undertaken, undertaken by some other people, people particularly with, with regard to uh, developing country companies that are involved in Africa. Hey, thanks, Barry. Um, this is about the a uh, labor market issue, right? You talk about the uh, profit differential between Chinese enterprise and non-Chinese. And then um, I suppose the, did you, uh, you have a data on wage differential among the local. Yes, we Then do. here is, it seems to me, they are hiring different layers of labor in Africa. And, you know, so it's really not, a, you compare those two localizations, they look quite possibly, they hire uh, people with uh, less skills 
labor there. That, that's, that's one issue. And also, two weeks ago, um, Post Magazine had an article on tour industry in Zambia. You were interviewed for that. Uh, here is, a, seems to me, a lot of Westerners, they go in, they build five-star hotels. Now Chinese are coming in, three-star hotels. Not only tourists coming from China and Japan, and also, also local middle-class people are using those. It seems to me that there are other issues to, to be explored. Thank you. It's certainly true that it's um, of great interest to compare labor standards uh, for Chinese enterprises in Africa and those of other foreign investors. And this comparison is made constantly. That is, the point is made uh, particularly by Western media that uh, Chinese companies pay less uh, than other foreign investors do. But just as you've said, uh, the nature of the workforces is different as between Chinese companies on the one hand and other foreign investors. If you make a comparison uh, that's based upon similar workforces, then the, the big difference that's claimed largely disappears. For example, uh, as I mentioned, our primary field site has been Zambia. Our primary field site within Zambia has been the copper mines. And we've compared, uh, through a survey done uh, this past summer, well, Northern Hemisphere summer, uh, in Zambia, uh, we looked at wages being paid, actually being paid, uh, to miners employed by Chinese companies and miners employed by other foreign investors. And we found that the miners employed by Chinese companies, on average, uh, earn about 90% of what uh, the miners who are employed by other foreign investors earn. Uh, the difference is accounted for not only by the fact that the Western mines have been around for ages and the Chinese mines have been established relatively recently, so the workforce has not been able to move up the grades as much uh, in Chinese companies as in other foreign companies, but also by something I alluded to in my talk, and that's a huge difference in profitability. As I mentioned, Chinese mines tend to be the much more marginal mines. Chinese mines in Zambia have made little or no profit, but they're state-owned companies, so they can do that for an extended period of time, and they can do that uh, for political reasons. Uh, but the companies owned by, uh, well, Canadian uh, firms, uh, Barrick Gold, uh, first quantum minerals, for example, these are immensely profitable, particularly uh, first quantum minerals, Vancouver Company, which owns mines in Zambia and uh, DRC. Uh, their mine in Zambia made a profit for them every year for the past five years of one billion US dollars. Uh, Chinese owned mines, they are lucky if they can make 30 million dollars in profit. So. The fact that their workers are paid 90% of what the workers are at other companies uh, is to some extent a function of those kind of objective differences. David, yeah, Barry, a couple of uh, comments. Thank you very much. Um, uh, one is um, you, you tend to laud China for keeping its employees, its own employees, um, in South South Sudan during the Civil War or um, in other places where there was Ebola, um, I, I don't think the workers would appreciate that. <laughs> um, and and, and so, so I wonder to what extent that's a function of management styles between Western corporations and Chinese corporations where the Chinese corporation could say, you will stay, and a Westerner would just not tolerate that. That's point number one. Um, the second thing that struck me was um, your point that Chinese, uh, uh, when they calculate or when they focus on localization, tend to lo focus on local, on, on the the sort of the the lower lower bracket of workers, and that they don't send their managers. Yeah, but I remember um, when I did in interviews 25 years ago for UNDP projects and other UN projects in China, 
Chinese were adamant about not wanting to have the UN bring in foreign, some of them Tanzanians, some of them, you know, people in this UN network of high salary people, and insisted that the managers of these projects should be localized. So so it's sort of, you know, it's one it's okay if the when it's coming to China, the Chinese insist that the managers should be localized, but when they send their own projects or people that they don't do that. And and the third question would be just just to raise the issue is the whole question. I never heard the word corruption, um, and and I wonder to what extent, uh, you know, I mean, the U.S. I, I attended a seminar, a conference um, uh, in December on Chinese firms going overseas, and uh, two government ministers on the on the uh, on not ministers but good uh, of uh, uh, sort of bureau chiefs sitting on the stage in one company, and I just asked them very quickly about the problems of uh, Chinese firms going overseas and how they deal with the demands for corruption. And uh, the government officials just didn't want to talk about it at all. And I said, you know, the United States has an anti-corruption law, and in most cases, it's pretty effective. People have to be pretty careful, which you can comment on. But I just was struck by the fact that the, the Chinese government officials just didn't want to want to talk about it when it's such an obvious issue, especially given the anti-corruption campaign in China. Well, I'll deal with the, the questions in the reverse order. Sure. Uh, as for corruption, there's plenty of it, and um, it's only to be expected. Uh, at, at the outset, I would say that. <laughs> hmm? At the outset, I would say that. Uh, the payment of bribes uh, by Chinese companies is not exceptional in Africa. That is to say, uh, other foreign companies also pay bribes. And as for whether U.S. companies pay bribes, uh, it's more difficult to establish because, first of all, I don't interview uh, the heads of U.S. companies. I don't really know what they would tell me, whether they would be forthcoming or not. I can tell you that I have talked to Chinese managers. The managers of every com company that I've interviewed, pretty much, I have asked them about bribery. And uh, while I can readily understand why some Gao Gambu would not want to talk to you about corruption, um, these Chinese managers are perfectly willing to talk to us about corruption. And they are particularly willing to talk to us about the corruption that is involved with regard to one topic, and that is work permits. Because they want to be able to bring some Chinese, at least, uh, to do whatever they do, be managers or engineers at their enterprises in Africa. And it is almost universally the case that in order to get work permits, which they are entitled to by local law, they have to pay bribes. They have to pay bribes to uh, the Home Affairs Ministry, to the Labor Ministry, et cetera. And of course, they don't like having to pay bribes. It's quite expensive, actually. Uh, but they really are convinced that they have little choice. Uh, there have been some who have told me, well, we tried to resist paying bribes. That didn't work out very well uh, for them. Uh, and they are well aware that what they are doing is what other companies have done for a very long time. So uh, it's true I didn't mention it. I, maybe I didn't even think about it because it seems to me that it's so much part of the way things work, at least in certain countries. Um, and it's, of course, not something that uh, local African governments think is desirable. I think that a lot of African leaders are quite sincere in wanting to curb corruption, uh, but uh, they find it very difficult to do. In part, uh, it's because administrations in many African countries uh, change from time to time. And uh, there's a lot of rent seeking. There are a lot of people who look upon uh, getting into power as a way to accumulate wealth, et cetera. And bribery is just naturally part of that. And then, of course, there's, there's the, the functions that normally attend uh, having economies that are so closely tied to one 
production of one commodity or having one particular kind of industry. We're well acquainted with that. So um, in terms of um, questions of management localization, uh, it's true that there's a difference in perspective between Chinese companies on the one hand and African elites in terms of the degree to which uh, they think management should be localized. But as I mentioned, Chinese managers think that, um, well, they would be happy to be replaced by local Africans as soon as uh, people who have the experience can be lured back from uh, working for working abroad or be, can be lured away from working for some other foreign investor. Uh, Chinese companies are at quite a disadvantage in terms of acquiring local managers, some of whom are extremely competent and know the local situation very well and would be very good to hire. Uh, but this is another frustration which Chinese managers have talked to us about, the difficulties they have in competing with other foreign investors, with local companies, etc. And then again, the factor that I mentioned before, the very high rate of emigration of uh, highly skilled Africans uh, to the developed countries. So this makes things rather difficult and accounts for, I think, a difference in situation between what you were describing in terms of what um, was the case in China uh, to even 25 years ago to what is the case today uh, in Africa. Now, it's not fair that I asked three questions. <laughs> <laughs> Kelly. We have time for Yeah, um, so we're past the normal hour, but I think the discussion is very interesting. We'll probably, but if people do need to leave, don't, you know, feel free to. But let's just continue for another five or ten minutes if that's okay. Then you can answer my question. Okay. <laughs> Thanks so much for your presentation, Gary. I noticed that the, the surge in Chinese investment um, also corresponded with the stimulus after the global financial crisis. And so I'm wondering to what extent, now that the stimulus funds are, have dried up and the government is kind of cracking down on additional investments coupled with the anti-corruption campaign, you see the, the trend is continuing. Um, relatedly, uh, to what extent, uh, what's the proportion of state-owned enterprise versus kind of private investment in Africa? And then finally, and I know this one's completely unfair, is uh, are you aware of any differences in patterns in Chinese investment in Africa versus Latin America? Hmm. I slipped in three questions. Too. Yeah, but, you know, we have to have a new rule about numbers of questions. <laughs> <laughs> the question. I didn't wait. May I always ask a question afterwards? Sure. May, we, may you want to collect them? Uh, I'll, I'll answer Kelly's first. I'll, I'll get to yours, though, definitely. Uh, in terms of uh, funds being available, uh, it's true that the stimulus is largely over. But uh, China still has a huge reserve, $4 trillion U.S. dollars uh, in foreign reserves. And uh, the Chinese government is looking for ways for its state-owned enterprises to make use of that capital, especially uh, because although we tend to think while well, the global financial crisis was now years in the past, uh, there still are huge numbers of opportunities coming up uh, for Chinese companies to acquire uh, other companies around the world and particularly in developing countries. Uh, I mentioned that Zambia is my primary field site. Uh, the price of copper in Zambia has fallen dramatically in the last year or so. And uh, the Zambian government has raised taxes and royalties on uh, copper mining in Zambia recently. The result is that there are several big foreign investors in that country who are probably thinking seriously about running away, giving up in the same way uh, that they gave up in 2008 and 2009. Uh, this would include, for example, Barrick Gold that I mentioned earlier, a Toronto company uh, which owns mines in several parts of the world, including in Zambia, it owns the Moana Mine. And they've already shut down their production there uh, as a result of the fall in the price of copper and the rise in taxes and royalties. And I can guarantee that at least a couple Chinese state-owned enterprises are 
talking right now about acquiring that mine. And the same thing I think will happen in many parts of Africa uh, if commodity prices stay relatively low. Um, that is, counter-cyclical investment will again be the way that Chinese companies will go, and they will get the full backing of the central government and provincial uh, governments for their enterprises to make those kind of acquisitions. There also are quite a number of greenfield projects going forward in Africa by Chinese companies that, while they may not be very profitable in Africa, are very profitable elsewhere in the world and have the resources to do that. Um, and then um, your question about the balance of private companies and SOEs. Uh, there are several very large uh, private companies <coughs> involved in uh, investment in Africa from China. And uh, Gu Jing, uh, who's at the Institute for Development Studies uh, in Britain, has done a very interesting study of private Chinese investment in Africa. Uh, in terms of the proportion, I would say that it's roughly half and half now. But that's in really rough terms. And of course, it varies from country to country. But in terms of uh, total assets, numbers of employees, those kinds of measurements, roughly half and half. Of course, if you look at companies, per se, then um, there are many more private companies than there are state-owned companies, because these are small and medium-sized companies, often family-owned companies. And uh, they also hire a lot of local workers. Uh, the Brenthurst Foundation in South Africa did a study of this and found that even the smallest Chinese family-owned enterprises, where there's the husband and wife running a so-called China shop, uh, they, they also have, on average, somewhere between four and eight local workers that they've hired. So again, they, that, that kind of private enterprise has to be taken into account because there's so many of them now uh, run by Chinese, and the number is growing very rapidly. Uh, then the comparison between Africa and Latin America. Uh, well, this is certainly a comparison uh, that lots of people are interested in. And uh, Latin America, the, the Chinese investment in Latin America is not my field. Uh, we have somebody um, who is at City University. Uh, his name is, do you remember? I can't remember either. But anyway, there is a scholar at City University uh, from Spain um, who. His name is Ruben Gonzalez. <laughs> right. <laughs> there he is. I know. <laughs> yes. Uh, who, who studies uh, Chinese investment in Latin America, and there's several other people who are doing it. And it's just only very recently, I think, where comparisons have started to be made between uh, investment in Africa and investment in Latin America. I think generally investment in Latin America, and again, I'm not a specialist on this, but I think generally in Latin America there is more investment in agriculture than there is in Africa. Uh, there have been lots of studies done very recently about uh, Chinese investment in agriculture in Africa. Yen Hai Rong and I have produced a study about that. Deborah Braudigam um, at Johns Hopkins also uh, works on that field. And uh, Chinese investment in Africa is still fairly small scale, but Chinese investment in Latin America is much larger. Also, I think uh, Chinese companies have been involved in more uh, partnerships with larger Latin American companies uh, than is the case in Africa at this point. But that also is starting to change. Given yes. The time, I do want to, I want to close the seminar, I think, very, if, uh, he'll take, I think, a few more questions uh, afterwards, but I do want to give a few more chance to, to stay on schedule. So thank, thank you very much, Barry. Great. Thank you.